So good morning, everyone, uh, or good evening, wherever you're at. Uh, thank you so much for joining this experiment of a webinar today. Um, we uh, at Utopia, we're an urban innovation group for emerging cities and their slums, and we're building a network of city labs across Asia, Africa, Latin America to try to help build an urban innovation ecosystem. And one of the things that we do is pull together a community of people that care about the future of cities. Uh, and the direction that particularly emergent cities in Asia, Africa, Latin America might head. Uh, today, we've pulled together some brilliant minds um, of our friends uh, to chat about the future of emergent cities and how they might adapt to this incredibly chaotic era. So we see that, uh, you know, currently we have uh, these, the chaos of, of pandemics uh, that we're facing, uh, the chaos of structural injustices that are becoming ever evident uh, in our lives. Uh, and so we've invited people to share as if they were in their living room chatting together about some of their thoughts about the future of, of cities. And when we talk about the future of cities, we're really talking about the future of societies. Uh, when our cities reach uh, 88 million people, as Lagos is projected to reach, when uh, Dhaka has 76 million people, when Mumbai has 67 million people, what will their cities look and feel like? Uh, how will they evolve under the intensity of this chaos? That's a question that we're deeply curious about. And so today is a, a bit of a different type of a, an event. It's designed to be informal. Uh, it's designed to be intimate. Uh, it's a four hour relay of conversations between two people at a time. And so uh, come in and come out uh, as you can. Uh, there will likely be a bit of rough transitions between uh, the, 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 during the relay. Uh, we've got the Q&A opened, uh, but just to set your expectations, we do ask that you type in your questions. Uh, for the different panelists, but likely we won't be able to answer them directly today. Uh, we'll try to collect them and respond to them in, in, in due time. So I'd say welcome to this living room. Thanks for bringing your imagination today. Uh, now I want to hand this over to Raul and Araceli to kick us off today. Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi. Okay, doke. So, hi, Raul. Um, hi, uh, do you? you want? Good, thank you. Would you like to um, start by introducing yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Rahul Merotra. I am an architect. Um, I also teach at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. I'm a professor of urban planning and design, uh, and I have a practice in Mumbai. And I divide my time between working in Mumbai, uh, uh, in with my architectural practice and my research, and then teaching at the Graduate School of Design. Great. So um, we had exchanged um, a couple um, of um, emails back and forth. And what I thought was really interesting about your work was looking at urbanism as a tool for equity. Um, so yeah, so if we want, if you want to, I guess, jump straight into that and um, explain a little bit more about what how, how does your work do that and how do we use that in navigating um, future cities or the formation of future cities? Great, great question. Difficult one, complex, uh, but I think it's something that we need to really deal with. And I think Jonathan's introductions, uh, I, I'll sort of use as a segue uh, about the kind of complexities he, he talked about. And, you know, for me, uh, the question of equity, uh, well, there are two bits to this. One is that I think as we see everything emerging around us and things are moving at such a fast uh, pace, you know, there, there are a series of layers that we've got to understand and we've got to understand how, how these are in operation actually simultaneously because otherwise what we tend to do is we begin to revolve our conversations around one of these layers and so what are these layers i mean you know there's one of climate change and of course that has massive implications even on the question of equity in the way it displaces people in the way i mean the whole refugee crisis you could argue is linked in many ways by political rife that is triggered off by issues of climate change, whether they're droughts, water, you know, there are many, many issues related to climate change. And then you have now another layer of the pandemic, which has sort of uh, high 
heightened in inequities, uh, you know, in a mind-boggling way uh, around the world, actually. And, you know, the notion of ownership of home and all of that has become such a precious kind of commodity. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, the people most affected by it are the poor, uh, etc. And then you have these layers of racism, of caste conflict. And I mean, there's so many kinds of social inequities that play out. And I think the question is that you can't, you know, dive into one of those and hope to find any solution or even a meaningful way forward. Uh, and so the question becomes, how do you actually deal with all these different layers simultaneously in order to understand uh, the question of equity and inequity. And, and I think for me, my work as an urban designer and planner, more than, even an architect, I would think all of them, is really about trying to understand or trying to frame this in ways that would be useful for us or give us agency uh, in terms of our own professional skills, but also as citizens to engage with these questions. And for me, one useful way to look at this is through the question of scale. Right. So let's just simplify scale. So what is what does equity at scale mean? Because at different scales, there are different ways you can deal with the question of equity. And I think this is really uh, my more kind of pointed response uh, to your probe or to your question. So just to simplify this, let me look at let, let's just take the large, medium and small scale. Of course, one can nuance it even further, but just for simplicity, let's mm. look at that. And so, you know, at the large scale, you have questions of climate change, you have ecological concerns, concerns of the watershed, regional dynamics, national questions and policies. And the instruments at this scale are usually policy, uh, the, the, their economic and social policies, cultural policies and all of that. And then you have a middle scale, which is I think the scale of what you would call urban design, let's say, which is the scale of a city, neighborhoods, uh, how a fabric uh, might generate forms of equity or ha help resolve those, etc. And then you have a small scale, uh, which is, I would say, the building, um, the way a sidewalk is made, uh, where you have access to public space, etc., uh, which is really at the small scale. Now, I think they're all critical. Uh, often what happens is, depending on the forum of the discussion, we get stuck at one of these scales mm -hmm. and not often realizing their interconnectedness. So even at the middle scale, a building in the way it's formulated, in the way its threshold is defined, in the way it creates even visual porosity, even in ways it creates an illusion of equity, I think can be dramatically important in the way uh, we imagine our cities. And so I would think if I have to just sort of place myself uh, in, in, in this kind of scalar question, uh, I would think uh, my work as an architect and many others who I know uh, as, an, an, as an urban designer is perhaps more effective uh, at the middle scale. And so I might be nourished by the small and the large scale. I might uh, uh, be mindful of them. Uh, but I know then my agency in terms of the skills I bring and how I operate as an agent in society would be at the middle scale. And really, this is the bigger question. And as I pose to my students, you know, we have a sphere of concern and then we have a sphere of influence, right? Our spheres of concern must continuously expand, uh, you know, uh, but then we have to be mindful continuously about our sphere of influence. Otherwise, we become cynical because as your sphere of concern, and this is where scale comes in again, expands, it actually is enriched, but then it begins to diminish your agency if you're not mindful and sharply focused and honest about where your sphere of influence lies. And really, I think what we should be aspiring to, or at least I aspire to, is how one can make that intersection continuously between our spheres of concern and our spheres of influence. And this is where I think scale uh, as a notion, as a way of organizing our thoughts and operations, uh, perhaps could be useful. Okay, um, so could you narrow down what you, like your thoughts and your principles into, so say that there was um, no budget of limitation, what would be three tangible things or three tangible asks that you would say, okay, 
in, you know, in the very near future, because I don't think there's so much urgency that I don't think we need to be talking 20 years or 30 years from now, that might actually be too late. But if we could say right now, what would be the three things that you would change as a must at any part of, as you said, at any part of the scale? You know, I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I, not that I disagree with the question, but I might frame it differently. Uh, which is if you if you if you draconically gave me three things, I, I would say I'd place at least one of those in the longer term and restrict two to the shorter term because I mean I think part of the problem is um, yes I mean I think we need to have responses in the shorter term because you know it affects people on the ground it's a whole generation growing up in some neighborhoods and of course one has to be empathetic to that condition but we've got to continuously place our imaginations also uh, in the long term and so if i the way i understand your question i think you're challenging me or you're provoking me to say that more pointedly how would one imagine these playing out in cities uh, and I think, uh, you know, and of course, there, there are many things, but I just want to sort of offer uh, two broader ideas, and then we can maybe use that to discuss this further. One is, you know, I think uh, in, in cities in particular, uh, and again, it, 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 this is what one would do if one had the power, as you said, or the ability to do these few things, you know, is resituate a uh, a kind of holy trinity, so to speak, uh, in cities, which bizarrely we've all seemed to have forgotten, uh, and it kind of disappears from our conversation, which is this sort of holy trinity between livelihoods, mobility, and dwelling. Uh, and I'm using dwelling more than housing, because housing, you know, has a baggage and it, it has space defined in a very particular way. But I Think the relationship in any urban system uh, between uh, the ability to engage with livelihoods in whatever form, uh, to dwell in a place and to be mobile, uh, because it's the networks that enrich cities in some ways, is, is something of very critical balance. Uh, the need for its balance is very critical. Uh, and we seem to have lost it. I mean, one could argue many of the problems with the North American suburbia, which is so dependent on gas uh, to operate for mobility, is a complete disaster. Uh, I mean, of course, there are many cities around the world that have been mindful of this and um, are very efficient uh, as a result. So, I mean, I think bringing that balance back uh, together, I would put as the highest priority. Okay, but how... So sorry, but how do we do that? I just want to make sure that we anchor in intangible solutions because you said something before that was that was poignant about needing to have more empathy for the now. I think it's empathy and urgency that we have to have in the now. Um, I don't know anything about the global south, but I do know that certainly in cities in the in the north, um, you know, America right now is going through a massive, massive turmoil. Um, mm -hmm. And over here in the UK, we also seeing it um, that people have gotten sick from COVID due to the way the built environments are laid out. So I press again, what are the things that, what are the nodes that we need to either change or influence or specifically what are three principles that we have to, you know, we have to bring forward. We can, you know, that we can say we have to do the following in order for cities to actually be for everybody and, and healthy for everybody. But yeah, correct. And I mean, I think that's where I might differ with the way you're posing the question, because I think that is myopic because we're, okay, so I can say uh, in the slums, let me put a sanitation hub everywhere and I should deploy that in 24 hours. Of course I should do that, right? I should make sure water can get in there. I, I, can, I can make sure that uh, we suddenly put in emergency housing that we deploy the density in a particular way. But yes, of course, those, so, so those, are what I would call emergency modes, and we need to do that. But we can't lose sight of the broader principles that we need to address, because otherwise we're going to loop back into this problem very quickly, correct? I don't think density is an issue, as is being implied in many discussions, uh, as where the problem re resides. I think the problem has to do with infrastructure. Infrastructure takes a long time to, uh, to put in. I mean, so for example, let me just jump to a very specific example of Dharavi in Mumbai, which is probably Asia's largest slum, uh, to be more pointed to your question. So what do we do there? I mean, people can't social distance. There's not water for everyone. 
Right, so we can do emergency means of putting in sanitation hubs, places where they're checked and you know all of that, maybe even clinics, maybe even putting like hospitals like they did in China very quickly. But finally, the solutions to Dharavi lie in the way we orchestrate the metropolitan region of Mumbai. And we must use the pandemic, we must use these emergencies also to push those bigger ideas. Otherwise, we lose sight of them and our, our responses are emergency responses, which are short term. Of course, we have to do that. I'm not saying we don't have to do that. But I mean, I think those are quite obvious. Um, okay, uh, well, they give, me the, they give me then the ideas that we need to, to move forward. Well, I mean, I think the ideas is uh, the ideas are how. Uh, so, look, I mean, I think it, this depends on you know different cities in different countries. So let's just take India because I mean, at least my work uh, seems to be focused there. Uh, so, in, in the case of India, there are two major major issues that are sort of uh, emerging, and I think the major one is a class one. Uh, and I don't know how much you many of our viewers have followed it, but we've had a reverse migration of. 30 million people uh, in India in the last month uh, going back to the villages, which is like mind blowing, correct? So, uh, the, so what that points to is a bigger question, which is we have overfilled our mega cities without the capacity to absorb people. Clearly, this is a great opportunity for the government to go in and deploy that infrastructure, not in Mumbai, which is what the emergency would make us do, but in all the smaller towns where these people have gone back. And it's so much easier to deploy the emergency infrastructure in those places, whether they're hospitals, whether it's good water supply, and it will leave a trace because it will actually have an impact. If you try to do those emergency means in a slum, yes, in the short term, it will be very important, but it's not going to leave a trace because you haven't solved the fundamental problem of housing. And so therefore, I come back to what I was saying about scale. And this is, there is no easy solution. And that's why it's hard to bring it to two or three points. But I think we have to simultaneously think even in an emergency mode across these scales, because there are things that can be deployed across these scales, which will leave much longer term traces. Yeah. So go to another example. I'll just go to Medellin in Colombia, where if I use that principle of mobility, Ability, livelihoods and dwelling. I mean, they solved their problem brilliantly with the cable car system that connected the favelas, mm. that allowed forms of mobility, that in a few years, dwellings improved because people got connected to the larger urban system, which they were isolated from, right? Now that move, which took a year or two to do, has had an impact which will last for decades and decades. It was also an emergency move because there was violence that was un unprecedented in those favelas. Uh, and they solved it in this vision with a, with a longer term impact. And so my plea is just that, uh, that I think while we do respond to, you know, two or three pointed things, or we do respond to what might be the emergency mode, which is very important for reasons of empathy and you know, humanity. Uh, but I think we also have the responsibility to keep situating those in bigger scalar and longer term questions and be ambitious about the traces they can leave with a longer view. I mean, I think that's uh, really the point I'd like to make. Okay. Um, so moving on to um, one of our other points was, so it's not, it's, it's a, it, you know, we are going to have to accommodate more people in cities, supposedly, as, as the trend is at the moment. Um, I think it might, it, there's also um, trends that COVID might be changing that um, in regards to people maybe wanting to move away from cities. Um, so what would you say from the perspective of growing a city in a much more biosensitive manner in order to allow for both accommodating mm -hmm. more people, but also moving forward in line with um, ecological health? Yeah. No, no, I think that's really, a, that's like the, the most important question today. And uh, I think uh, for a minute, I'll just sort of not challenge, but I'll kind of, you know, question even the premise um, that I think is going around. I, I don't mean what you've sort of stated, which is, uh, will cities grow? Uh, uh, and are we, uh, do we really want to, or do we really think that that will happen? I'm not sure. Uh, and I think this pandemic and when we come out on the other side uh, might 
prove, at least in some geographies, a kind of different condition. Uh, you know, it's interesting, our mega cities, which is the ones you're know, kind of by default alluding to, the ones that we need, you know, uh, to expand or to, to make more absorptive. It's interesting that I think what, and this is because of, you know, historic reasons, that uh, I think over 50 or 60 percent of our mega cities are coastal cities because, of course, these were port towns and they were part of colonial trade routes and all of that. And we are like lemmings, you know, all rushing to the cliff uh, because um, these cities are ones that are going to, I think, face the biggest problems uh, with climate change. And so I think as that accelerates and you know, as we speak, Mumbai, my hometown is sort of bracing for perhaps its worst cyclone uh, ever. And they expect the city to flood and this is going to you know, make landfall on Wednesday. Uh, so it's crazy. Uh, and I, I believe that uh, I think what the pandemic will do, and I think is going to do that in India, it's, it's actually going to see a decline in that growth because I think uh, people, uh, people uh, and if governments can act in actually in networking and improving lives in smaller towns within the hinterland of the country, uh, I think uh, it will put less pressure on our city. What the reverse migration, which is 30 million people in a conservative sort of number has shown that there is an amazing flux that actually occurs uh, in our cities anyway, which means if there are 30 million people who were working for a few months or half a year in the cities who have all rushed back, uh, shows that they're not even committed to the urban condition. And, and that's probably one reason why people choose to just for livelihoods live in squalor. Uh, and so I think it's really contingent upon governments to use this opportunity to create this decentralization. You know, when I was a student in the 80s, our professors actually taught us that there was nothing like a city that was too big. The city could keep growing into infinity. It's a matter of how you respond in terms of governance. Now, 30 years later, I, I'm, I'm kind of very cynical about that. And I, I, I think there are upper, upper limits and how we recognize these, how we create new networks. And I think in this world, the technologies we have that create by default and interconnectedness uh, could, I think, be used differently. Having said that, just to your question, which was quite pointed, I would say again, in the same way as we talk about scales, um, when we look at cities and how we make them more robust uh, in the way I think your question was posed, again, we should, you know, we, we land up getting kind of obsessed or stuck with one domain or the other, and it's usually housing uh, naturally. Uh, but, you know, there are about five or seven critical domains that make uh, the operation of, of a city robust, healthy. Um, and I think this loops back to your very first question of equity. Uh, and those domains are, you know, water, mobility, energy, food, uh, urban form, because urban form has a huge impact. And I think all these domains actually uh, uh, are related to the question of equity and access to these as resources, uh, including urban form. And we can talk about how neighborhood design can make a difference. Uh, and I think, again, we have to change the imagination within urban planning and urban design to simultaneously look at these domains and not get obsessed with any one of them as the magic bullet, which we often land up doing. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I, I think just to sort of in summary, say that I think the plea I'm making uh, and what my position is in terms of the question of equity uh, and all the very pointed questions I think you've raised, and I'm sorry I resisted uh, giving you uh, the magic three points is that I think there is a scalar question across which we have to work simultaneously. And there's a question of many domains that we have to stitch. That is what will give us an ecological to go to your, your, your question of the bio. Uh, it, it'll give us a, a much more ecological imagination of what urbanism uh, could be in the future. And I, I believe uh, that imagination will take us closer to addressing the question of equity and social justice and many other questions like that. Okay, thank you for that. Um, so I'm being told that we have to wrap up. So I think if do you would you like to make any any final statement or any final comments? No, I think I, I think what I just said was, yeah, wrapped it up. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thanks.